Pokemon days were more than a week ago. People were excited about some kind of Gen 5 remake, but we get Gen 6 instead. I myself am fond of Gen 5, just like many others. For those of you who knows a lot about Pokemon, what I'm gonna say next might be surprising. When I think about Gen 5, I always remember about Duran vs Heatmore, especially the memes. Gen 5 was 14 years ago, and somehow, I've seen the meme about Duran and Heatmore resurface over and over again, even in recent years. I'm aware that most people are just bashing on Duran, but maybe some of you are genuinely confused about their relationship. Some people say it was really irrational. Well, as a zoologist, I could definitely say it's not weird at all. In fact, it's very logical. There are a lot of cases like this in real world. It's called coevolution. So, let me brought up the question. What exactly is coevolution? Let's just jump straight to the point. Coevolution is an occurrence where two or more populations of organisms that interact with each other undergoes reciprocal evolution. Most of the time, those populations are from a different species. If that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry, I'll explain it with some example. Trust me, conceptually, it's very simple. So, let me just talk about Duran and Hitmore for a bit for those of you who knows nothing about Pokemon. Duran is basically an ant with a steel exoskeleton. Hitmore is an ant eater, but its tongue is flame. Well, I know it doesn't make sense. Maybe you could just say its tongue is covered by flame. That way, it makes more sense. So, for those of you who already understood about coevolution, these descriptions should make it obvious to you. Ant eaters almost exclusively eat ants and termites in real world. They use their long snout and tongue to slurp the ants. Let's just assume that's also the case for Pokemon. So, think about it like this. In the past, Duran is just an ordinary ant, and Hitmore is just an ordinary ant eater. Let's just say Ancient Hitmore exclusively eats Ancient Duran. One day, Ancient Duran evolved a new trait, that is, a steel exoskeleton, or steel armor to make it simple. After Duran got their steel armor, Ancient Hitmore can no longer eat Duran. Unfortunately, up till now, Ancient Hitmore exclusively eat Duran, and let's just say, there is no other prey for them other than Duran. So, it's either finding a way to be able to handle the steel armor, or, well, when extinct. And so, that's when Heatmore finally evolves a new trait, that is, the flame tongue. That way, Heatmore can handle the steel armor and eat them. And yes, that is an example of coevolution. Because of continuous predation by Heatmore, Duran evolves steel armor. In response to Duran's steel armor, Heatmore evolved flame tongue. This is an example of a prey predator coevolution. Besides this, there are other types of coevolution. For example, host parasite coevolution. In the host parasite coevolution, just like the one in prey predator coevolution, basically there is an arm race between the host and parasite. The host evolved ways to defend themselves against the parasite while the parasite evolved ways to nullify the defense. Let me brought up the cuckoos as an example. Cuckoos are brood parasite, meaning they lay their egg in other bird's nests. The host will then incubate that egg. Cuckoos egg usually hatch sooner, and the offsprings are usually bigger and noisier than the host's offspring. That way, the host can't help but give more food to the cuckoo. In the early states of parasitism, their egg might not seem to be similar. As time goes by, Cuckoo evolved in a way so that their egg become more similar to the host egg. That way, it won't be noticeable. Reciprocally, the host evolve a way to identify their own eggs and offsprings. Some host species might even produce more complex and diverse egg shell pattern and coloration. That way, it's harder for the cuckoo to mimic the host egg. And so, it makes it easier to be differentiated. In general, the host will also learn to identify their egg better. The host will get rid of the cuckoo's egg if they can identify it. This cycle will continue until one of them gave up. Either the host move and live far away from the cuckoo's to escape parasitism, or the cuckoo's choose another host to increase the success rate. Some coevolution can also be mutualistic. 
In fact, you often see this in your daily life. The most common example is the plant disperser coevolution. For example, the rapid coevolution of fruit and frugivores, aka the fruit eaters. Some plants produce fleshy fruit. In turn, some animals are attracted to eat the fruit. By doing so, they disperse the seed. More diverse and unique fruit then evolve. And by doing so, more and more animals evolve to become frugivores. More plant dispersals, more food for animals. Win-win. Oh, and same goes for the flower and pollinator coevolution. One of the unusual examples of this is the case between the snow skink, Carinaskinkus microlepidotus, and the honeybush, Rikea squaparia. Honeybush have to endure cold temperature and strong wind. For this, they are covered by calyptra, which is a protective cover made out of used petals. In flowering plants, the calyptra is usually detached when they reach maturity, but the honeybush retain this calyptra. This is done as to not let the seed disperse during harsh weather. So, as what usually happens in the case of flowering plants, they produce sweet nectars to attract pollinators. And guess what? Most of the nectars are covered by the calyptra. And here is where the snow skink takes part. The snow skinks are active during warmer temperature. These snow skinks will then seek food during their active time. They seek nectars. And so, they chew on the calyptra of the honeybush, breaking the calyptra and exposing the seed. And so, it's almost guaranteed that the seed of the honeybush will only disperse during a warmer temperature, which increases its chance of proliferation. Oh, and because there is basically no competition, the snow skinks can be specialized in consuming the honeybush nectars. Again, win-win. By the way, these skinks are not pollinators. Their part is just to open the calyptra. But research has shown that out of 60 fruits from the flowers with the calyptra intact, no seed were released. But out of 60 fruits where the calyptra were removed by the skin, 57 successfully released the seed. So, their fate is basically linked to each other. There are many more examples of coevolution, of course. I could talk about it for days if I have to give every example. And, not all interaction between two populations led to coevolution. Some interactions are not really reciprocal, but still, it led to adaptation and evolution. But that's a topic for another week. For now, let's just learn about coevolution. And that's all for now. <laughs>